Seattle Bay. Uh, my name is Brad Rutherford. I'm the COO of the Seattle Aquarium. And we're happy to host the fourth stop of the Federal Fisheries Management Listening Tour. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we're currently on the homelands of the Coast Salish people who have stewarded these lands and waters for generations. We have a great group assembled today. I'm glad to welcome Representative Huffman, as well as Representative Skyapal, Representative Delvenny, Representative Case, and the distinguished panelists for this important discussion on federal fishery management. The Seattle Aquarium supports sustainable seafood to ensure a healthy ocean, a healthy economy, and healthy people. We often share with our guests the success story of the canary rockfish, which you can see in our window on Washington Water. Canary rockfish were depleted, but science-based management turned that around and now they're thriving. Right right we appreciate the leadership of Congressman Huffman as well as our own Senator Cantwell for championing science-based fisheries management policy that will keep our ocean, people, and economy healthy. We look forward to hearing and learning from all of the panelists and guests here today. So let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to Representative. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pamela Jayapal, and I'm so proud to have the honor of representing this district, the 7th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. And uh, I want to first thank the Seattle Aquarium. Um, we are so fortunate in the 7th District to have incredible resources, including the aquarium. And we in our office have done a tremendous number of things here at the aquarium to lift up both the work of the aquarium, but also the work of advocates and partners in the region who have been Thank you so much to my colleague, Jared Huffman, who is the uh, subcommittee chair on the National Resources Committee of WOW, Wildlife, Oceans, and Waters. Waters, Oceans, and Wildlife. I got the, I got the order mixed up. Uh, we have had the opportunity to work together on a number of things. Jared is a proud member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which I co-chair, and he is also the co-chair of the Food Talk Caucus, um, which I'm very proud to be a member of. So, we are very grateful to you for including Seattle in your listening tour. Um, and then I also want to uh, welcome a, a case, Representative Case from Hawaii, for being here. Um, we are thrilled to have you here, and then it's always an honor and privilege to serve on the same delegation as Susan Delvey. So thank you all for uh, being a part of this, uh, this important event. Um, you know, sometimes the Southern District of Washington State is seen as a center for aerospace, which we are. People think that that is our primary um, mode of jobs and industry in the state, but people forget about the maritime industry. And they forget that actually we have a tremendous maritime sector here in, in Washington State, and that fishing has a very deep cultural significance to our state and to our district, both for the indigenous communities who land here occupying today, as well as for the thousands of people who work in and support the private fishing industry in this region. And I want to just take a moment to highlight an example of how important fishing is to our local economy here in this in this district in uh, In 2017, commercial fishing activities on the Port of Seattle alone generated 7,200 jobs with a payroll million dollars and 1.3 metric tons of seafood harvested by fishermen in the North Pacific fisheries. More than 671.2 million dollars in business output was generated by the seafood that was sold at maritime sports services like vessel maintenance and repair uh, and, and repair processing and full storage all located on the port properties. And in Washington in 2015 
this effort to consider uh, reauthorizing the Magnuson Stevens Act. And uh, it's great also, and I saw this at the great uh, expo across town, to see that both the uh, North Pacific and the Pacific regions are represented so strongly here. Uh, both of these regions, of course, have been real leaders in fisheries and management, uh, showing, I think, that focus on sustainability really does work. Uh, Alaska and Northwest are our home supports with some of the highest volume and value of commercial landings in the whole country. So we're here uh, because this is a perfect place to talk about healthy oceans and healthy fisheries, uh, which is two things obviously go hand in hand. Uh, this is a fourth stop on my national listening tour on reauthorizing uh, Madison Stevens Act. I want to give you a little background on what I'm trying to do. Uh, when I first came to Congress uh, and got on the subcommittee with jurisdiction over this issue, I was surprised to see that federal uh, marine fisheries management had like so many other issues uh, become something that people thought about uh, across the party lines. Uh, it had essentially devolved from a thing that used to be strongly bipartisan, almost non-political, to something that like so many other issues in Washington uh, became uh, a partisan issue to fight about. And so what I was hoping to do in putting together this, this listening tour is to reset the conversation. Uh, ideally, I would love for everybody in all the regions that we're visiting, and I'm committed to visit every region of the country with a fisheries management council, so we're about halfway through that tour right now. But ideally, I would love for everyone to just check their party affiliation at the door and join me and a whole bunch of amazing panelists with incredible backgrounds in a conversation about federal great fisheries management that's about science and facts and has very little to do with politics. I think that's the way we can possibly reset this conversation. I also want everyone to be part of it. I want it to be transparent. Uh, we see a lot of background deals in Washington. And I, I'm afraid that a few of the recent efforts to the Alabama campus uh, fell victim to a process that was less than inclusive, less than transparent. So we're going to try to reset that as well uh, as we do this. So uh, the first two stops in my tour were in California, uh, where I heard from uh, a lot of folks from Northern California on the weekend. And then uh, my, my constituents in Eureka think that I'm from Southern California because I'm in the Bay Area. But uh, that's actually Northern California to most people. And so uh, that was the other stop. Uh, and then last week, we were in the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, we were in Baltimore for a terrific listening session. We're now in Seattle. And I mentioned that a lot of stakeholders and, and experts and even panelists here today are also in Alaska. Uh, don't take this stop in Seattle to mean that I'm not going to get to Alaska, too. Uh, because I do want to go to Alaska. I understand how significant Alaska is. It deserves its own listening session. Uh, but we're glad to be here to take part uh, in this uh, session here in Seattle. Uh, so we're going to pretty quickly get to our panelists, and just to, to set the stage, I want to say that uh, I believe we start uh, from, we start with an acknowledgement that the Madison Stevens Act, while not perfect, no piece of legislation is perfect, uh, has really proved that managing our natural resources for the values of science and sustainability really works. These, uh, the science-based annual catch limits and rebuilding requirements and other important conservation and management standards that are at the, the core of the Madison framework has dramatically reduced overfishing in our country. It has resulted in a record number of stocks being rebuilt, which means, of course, people are fishing. Uh, and that's, that's what we're looking for. I think Madison, when implemented correctly, uh, has been very successful in supporting fisheries in the United States, and uh, many of our view is in the United States and the world in terms of our fisheries management. Uh, the, the stakeholder consensus that I've heard so far in this listening tour is that Madison is not broken, uh, but we can always make it better, and that's what this conversation is all about. We want to imagine what a modernized, reauthorized Madison Act should look like. And we know that as, as good as the act has been over the years, uh, we're going to have all kinds of new challenges. In fact, we're already facing challenges today that are new and different than we considered last time. 
serving as Washington State's designated representative on the North Pacific Council for the past 15 years, and I'm honored to be here today to speak on behalf of the Council. 
The North Pacific Council, in partnership with NOAA Fisheries and other agencies, develops regulations for fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska, Bering Sea, and Aleutian Islands. More than 50% of the seafood harvested in the United States comes from these waters. In addition to their significance to the nation, these fisheries are also extremely important to the economies, coastal communities, and cultures in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. They provide a sustainable annual yield of up to 3 million metric tons of fish, which generates approximately $2 billion in ex-vessel revenue. The MSA has provided us with the flexibility to develop a very successful fisheries management program in the North Pacific, resulting in global recognition for our sustainable and profitable fisheries. The current MSA already provides a proven framework for sustainable fisheries management and in our opinion, major changes are not necessary at this time. Nevertheless, we also recognize the potential benefits of increased flexibility in some circumstances. Amending the Act could provide all regional councils additional opportunities to optimize their fishery management programs. Any changes to the law providing additional flexibility should not erode the progress our nation has made in developing sustainable fisheries management. Following on my council's views on potential new provisions that we've heard discussed, in our experience, the MSA already provides regional councils the authority to address these issues, and new mandates may be less than helpful, potentially making our process less effective and could lead to litigation. If you take only one point from my remarks today, it is this. The North Pacific Council, under existing statutory authority, is already addressing each of these items without limitations other than finding the time and the resources necessary to tackle these challenging issues. Forage fish is one. The Council has already designated forage fish species in our ground fish fishery management plans and all directed fishing for these forage fish species in federally managed waters is prohibited. Any legislative definition of forage fish based on broad criteria will almost undoubtedly exclude some important types of forage, such as squid, and will unintentionally include important target fish species, such as sockeye salmon, and will result in differing interpretations and probably invite litigation. <coughs> Congress should recognize that in our marine ecosystems, nearly all species of fish are forage fish at some point in their lives. Each council should have the job of determining which species and life stages deserve protection as forage fish in their waters. Provisions that would require councils to specify catch limits for forage fish species to account for the diet needs of marine mammals or birds or other marine life requires an enormous commitment of resources, resources that we don't currently have. Prey needs for upper trophic predators are already accounted for in many cases as natural mortality removals in a lot of our stock assessment models. We're certainly facing the challenges of shifting stocks and climate change. In the past few years, we've witnessed major changes in North Pacific ecosystems and in distribution of fish stocks. For example, stocks of Pacific cod and Alaska pollock are moving far northward and away from normal fishing areas. The now infamous blob in the Gulf of Alaska virtually wiped out the largest year class of Pacific cod, and unprecedented numbers of seabirds, whales, and salmon have been washing up dead on beaches. The Council is gravely concerned that the magnitude and the speed of these changes threatens our ability to manage for sustainable seafood harvests. Because so much of the seafood consumed by U.S. residents is imported, threats of this magnitude to the domestic seafood supply must be taken seriously. The Council is equally concerned about the welfare of the peoples living in coastal communities of Alaska who are dependent on these ecosystems to sustain, sustain their subsistence way of life and culture. Until now, the Council has been able to provide the majority of America's seafood supply without impacting the subsistence communities and without degrading the integrity of these ecosystems. This balance, however, is jeopardized if scientists do not have the resources to predict the impacts of these climate changes. Better, more timely data would greatly assist the Council with managing fisheries in the face of climate change. We do not need additional provisions in the Magnuson Act to address these challenges. 
On the subject of habitat protection, the Council already has a strong record of protecting essential fish habitat and identifying habitat areas of particular concern. Over 665,500 square nautical miles, about 65% of our EEZ, has been closed to fishing and fowling trawls to protect vulnerable habitats for crab, rockfish, and deep sea corals. Some areas have been closed to all fishing gears, essentially creating marine reserves. These include coral gardens, pinnacles, and sea mounts. A map of the closure areas is attached to the written testimony that I've provided to all of you. The council is concerned that revising the definition of HAPSI to include the importance of, it, of its ecological function may invite litigation. Any provision that requires the council to prevent adverse effects on HAPSI habitat caused by fishing may be interpreted that regulations must prohibit any fishing impact on HAPSI. An all or nothing requirement limits our management flexibility and may create unnecessary adverse impacts on the fisheries without concomitant benefits to the habitat. Finally, I'd like to reiterate the Council Coordinating Committee's general thoughts regarding the reauthorization process. The CCC understands regional differences in management and if Congress requests, can offer guidance on proposed changes to the MSA. The CCC has already adopted these general tenets relative to any change in the MSA. Avoid across the board mandates and instead ensure that we have the ability to develop regional solutions to regional problems. Be expressed in the form of intended outcomes. Avoid unrealistic, expensive analytical mandates for implementing fishery closures. Avoid constraints that limit the flexibility of councils and NIMFs to respond to changing climates and shifting ecosystems. Avoid unfunded mandates and preservation and enhancement of stock assessments and surveys should be among the highest priorities. Once again, thank you very much for this opportunity and I'll be happy to answer questions from panelists in the audience. Thank you, Chairman and Linda Benkin. And really appreciate this opportunity to address this crowd be part of this hearing today. I've fished commercially for 35 years off Alaska and currently own and operate a small 35 foot curler lawn liner with my family at Sitka. I'm executive director of Alaska Lawn Line Fishermen's Association and testifying today on ALFA's behalf. Our organization has a 40 year history of advocating for sustainable fisheries and sustainable fishing communities. We're founding members of the Fishing Communities Coalition and the Marine Fish Conservation Network. Two years ago, I testified that the MSA was working well to protect and rebuild overfish stocks, but was working less well to provide for small scale fisheries and for the people in those communities and their access to the resources near their towns. While none of that has changed, and I intend to cover that, I have to start today as an Alaskan fisherman focusing on climate change. Alaska is in a climate crisis, and that crisis for me overshadows everything else right now. I'd like to share a few observations from my season on the water this past year. This summer, the absence of seabirds was eerie, as was the hot weather, the smoke rolling over the ocean from fires fires in a rainforest, the coccolithophore bloom around Sitka that turned the waters bright green, and algal blooms in other parts of the state. Many of you know that Alaska's air temperature is increasing twice as fast as the global average. You may not know that this near surface sea temperature in Alaska and the Gulf and the Bering Sea this past year was four to 11 degrees above normal. This fall, stock assessment scientists came to the council to let us know that in larval toes in the Gulf, they'd found an alarming lack of larval, the future of our fisheries, um, and that they had also seen a dramatic absence of cod, something we've seen in the last few years was repeating itself with that, that cod stock disappearing, moving north and disappearing from the Gulf of Alaska. Many have heard that the, that the Yukon reached 70 degrees, salmon were cooking, dying before they could spawn. In the Tungus National Forest, the rainforest, we had drought and extreme drought throughout the summer in some areas. Fish that couldn't reach spawning grounds 
temperatures that were so high in streams that the fish that did reach the rivers were not able to spawn. We also saw an infestation of sawfly new to our area. 2018, there were 40,000 acres affected by sawfly. 2019, there were 400,000 acres affected, again, driven by climate change. As, as Mr. Twight mentioned, we've seen seals, we've seen seabirds washing up. Over 500,000 mers died during the warm blot of years. We've seen whales emaciated and washing up on beaches and that warm blood is now reforming. To ensure that the fish and our coastal fishermen have a future, the reauthorization of the Magnuson Act has to factor in climate change, and it has to recommit to the conservative science-based fisheries management that were the founding principles. To our mind, there should be no talk of exempting any sectors from annual catch limits no consideration of raising the Bering Sea harvest cap or allowing increased pressure on forage fish or fish habitat, marine, coastal, or fresh. All ecosystems in Alaska are under siege, including the Tungus. Improved catch crowning across all sectors, commercial, charter, and sport must also be a priority through this reauthorization. All regions should be making steady progress towards ecosystem management and carefully adapting that management to the changes they're seeing in the ecosystems they manage. This reauthorization must also pay particular attention to the small-scale fishermen who were struggling to retain access even before climate change began to hit so hard. In Alaska as elsewhere, coastal fisheries are a critical source of employment, income, and cultural identity. Commercial fishing uniquely allows self-sufficient people, businesses, and communities to flourish in Alaska's remote places where other op economic opportunities are scarce. By the nature and operation of their small boats, coastal fishermen simply cannot move with the fish, nor is their capital mobile, nor are their hearts mobile. They're tied to community, they're committed to community, and the communities depend on them. Much of my work over the past decade has focused on supporting young fishermen and gaining access to this, these fisheries. I now feel as if I've encouraged and supported young people to enter fisheries that are at great risk of shifting out of their reach at best or disappearing completely if we don't act quickly. So what can be done? National Standard 8 was designed to protect the access of small-scale fishermen and fishery-dependent communities and their access to local resources. What I find in my experience is that often when National Standard 8 or 9 conflict with National Standard 1, decisions are tipped toward optimum yield and economic returns. As a result, economics continues to override community stability. We will never be an advocate for community stability overriding resource health. We will always put the health of the resource first but we do urge that this reauthorization of the NSA shift the national standard balance towards the long-term health of fishing communities and their sustained access of coastal residents to the local resources they've long depended on. Coastal fishermen are essential advocates for ocean health and sustainable fisheries. They are crucial components of coastal economies, and they're also right now on the front line of climate change. Management plans and regulatory systems must be designed to protect their access and be scaled to meet their needs. To summarize, ALFA, the coalitions with which we work, maintain that the Magnuson-Stevens Act created a successful structure for our nation's fishery. That structure rests on conservative science-based management across all sectors that is regionally informed by comprehensive stock assessment accurate catch accounting, active participation of fish habitat, bycatch reductions, and increased integration of ecosystem management. All that remains as important today as when the Magnuson Act was passed. The building climate crisis heightens the importance of being extra cautious with our resources as we move forward. We would likewise call to your attention the significant challenges faced by coastal, coastal fishermen and the growing impact to our rural communities of lost fishing access. Our fishing communities need sustained access and a regulatory system that works for them. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment, and I'd be also happy to answer questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Hoffman. My, my Congresswoman, <laughs> I get to live right here. Uh, so my name is Brent Payne. Um, I, uh, I'm in a, uh, born in Alaska. I was a lifelong salmon fisherman, previous life. Uh, young lady to cook in with. I uh, bought a catch boat and uh, a trip away from it about 10 years ago. I said, at least Brett, Brett there in the audience. Uh, Satin Manor, yes, sir, in the way. Seldovia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, so that's that my background. Yeah. Um, okay. um, but then after uh, growing up fishing, uh, I went to school and I, I got a job working for the North Pacific. Fisher Management Council. Linda was actually on the council when I was a staffer. Um, Dave Blue Hardy as well. And then uh, after I left the council, I started working for a group of boat owners here in Seattle called United Catch and Boats. And UCB is a 72 vessel member organization of, of the owners that, that own and operate the, the, the Bering Sea uh, and West Coast Pollock and, 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 and Hawaii and Midwater Pollock boats. Um, we just had our 27th annual membership meeting this morning. Pretty neat group of people I've been very blessed to work for. Uh, based right here in Seattle, and we're just, you know, both in Alaska and, and, and West Coast. So, with that, I, I want to talk about three issues. But before that, I really want to say, uh, you know, Senator Stevens and uh, Congressman Young and uh, Congressman Studs and uh, Warren Magnuson really hit the ball apart uh, in the early 70s when they came up with this act. And the, the biggest thing I think that is so wonderful about this act is the human element of the council process. If you look here, <laughs> Linda Bankin was a phenomenal council member. Dave Fluard was a phenomenal council member. Stephanie Madsen was a phenomenal council member. Because they, and, and, and don't bite now. We can rate him phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's the human element, that, and, it, and it's local and it's regional. And everybody, many people in this audience are very, very, very actively involved in the council, both on the West Coast here, the City Council, and the North Pacific Council. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. <coughs> Secondly, the, the information that's presented at these meetings by the professional staff, both the agency and the council staff, is invaluable. The environmental assessments and environmental assessment and our economic review process is invaluable. Yeah, we get the ability to have the best available information for these council members to, to make their decisions. And then thirdly, the selection process of who serves on the council is of uh, 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 utmost importance to get your best and brightest people from the agencies and the industry to serve on these councils. It's sort of like a mini legislature, but um, you get a lot more upfront and personal type interactions and the decisions get made at the regional level. And that was Senator Stevens' major mandate, that he didn't want decisions to be made in D.C., but rather made, you know, in Anchorage, Alaska, or, or, or here in Portland, Oregon, or wherever. So, really important. So, with that said, uh, I want to talk about three things. Adequate funding, the accountability of the harvest, and the relationship and responsibilities of the, the coastal states and the federal fishery managers. So, um, I think as a longtime industry representative of the West Coast and Alaska fisheries, uh, I've really witnessed the, the changes of the 96 Reauthorization Act and also the 2006 Reauthorization Act. In 96, actually, there was, before there was a Senator Cantwell, there was a Congresswoman Cantwell, <laughs> and we were lobbying her uh, and to, to talk about sustainability. And there were, and the, the environmental community and the, the industry partnered together to come out with some really amazing principles that are science-based. Uh, the, the definition of ACLs, acceptable catch limits, the overfishing criteria, the, the rebuilding criteria, were all a product of that 96 uh, Mason Act realization. And in 2006, it was reauthorized again, and we got some very clear language on human access privilege programs, catch share programs, and Dr. Fluhart is on this panel, but we, we incorporated the sensitive habitat, and also ecosystem-based management principles. And those were incorporated into the council process and both the Pacific Council and the West, and West Coast and the Alaska Council has, has, are now finishing up developing 
you know, in fact, we just have the five year review of the sensor fish habitat for the West Coast and in Alaska. And then there's the ecosystem committee that we're quite involved with that is working on those issues. So I think that's all good and fine. There doesn't need to be changed. I think um, there are some changes that, that in, in Senator Thomas Young's bill that, that tweak this a little bit, but it's really not major changes. Um, so let, if, if I could talk a little bit about funding, and I don't know if that's so much an MSA type thing, but the most important thing for, for my organization is adequate funding for trawl surveys and adequate funding for stock assessments. And in Alaska, for stock assessments, it's on an annual basis. They really do uh, annual stock assessment for almost every single targeted species. But on the West Coast, they don't do an annual assessment. They kind of have to pick and choose, but they just don't have the resources to do an annual assessment. Uh, the second thing is trawl surveys. Historically, in Alaska, there's been a survey on the Easter Bering Sea Shelf and Slope, and in the Gulf of Alaska, and also in the Aleutian Islands. So there are three different regions, and the agency's now kind of started to do some northern Bering Sea survey work with, with trawl vessels. But really, uh, we keep hearing for the last couple of years that they're reducing the number of vessels that can do those surveys. Yeah, because they don't have uh, the adequate funding. And there's also two vessels that are very important for us, the, the Oscar Dyson and, and, and uh, uh, Bell Shimada, which is the Nullock four ship midwater acoustic ships. Um, they have truncated the, the survey off the west coast. At one time they combined the sardine survey with the widening survey, that didn't work we're trying to figure out how to deal with inadequate funding. But those two survey ships are extremely important, at least for the guys I work for that fish in their water. Uh, and we need adequate funding for the acoustic survey work in the Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska, and the West Coast. So uh, I can't emphasize enough how important that is for, for NOAA to do those four principles of, of, of surveys and assessments over and above everything. The second topic I want to talk about is, is, is monitoring of the catch. If you don't have accurate monitoring of what is actually harvested, you can get into a lot of trouble. And the, the North Pacific Council has prided itself on developing a very robust observer program. In fact, my members 25 years ago agreed to pay for 100% observer coverage that industry pays. We pay $350 to $400 a day for every day that we go to see the fish. Stephanie's organization has two observers on their boat that they've agreed to pay for because we know the value of accurate monitoring of the data and data you know, accounting. You can't have good fishers management without it. Um, costs are also, getting back to this cost thing, um, we now are, are facing in the, in the Gulf of Alaska observer costs of up to $1,800 a day. Uh, Bill Twight is the chairman of the, of the Observer Monitoring Committee. Change the name um, for the North Pacific Council, and there's also a monitoring committee, uh, observer monitoring committee for the West Coast as well. And I'm a member of that uh, as an industry representative. Uh, we have in order to counter these costs of the high observer costs into an electronic monitoring program. And we've done under an EFP here on the West Coast for Whitey and non Hall since 2015, and we now are entering into a regulatory program. In Alaska, we're just embarking upon uh, electronic monitoring program for the Hawaiian vessels. The Linda's group and then a group out of Walmart have been involved with the groundbreaking EM work for the fixed gear smaller boats in Alaska. But the, the point I want to make here is that the agency has got to realize that they've got to keep the cost in mind and, and build an efficient program. We need a Volkswagen, we don't need a Cadillac. And it's hard to convince that to people who aren't paying the bills. Um, in Alaska, there's actually a, 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 a clause in the Magnus Act called the Research Plan Fee that allows the agency to assess a fee to the industry to pay for the observer coverage. And uh, but now we're finding that, that $1,800 a day under that program is a bit much because we and that's resulting in about 15 to 20 percent observer coverage. That's all we can afford. In the Barrett Sea, we have 100% observer coverage, costs us about $350 a day, and it's, it's working. <laughs> so uh, I, I, the, the issue of accountability and, and monitoring is really important, and, and keeping the agency accountable, costs down, and develop a good program.
Exxon Mines is a really good thing, I think, and we just are, are breaking through. So, the last issue I want to talk about is, is this issue of the state versus federal relationship. And I know there's the allocation aspect of that, and that's very dicey at times. Uh, but there, there are also the, the aspect of who contributes to the management of the stocks of fish that reside both in the state waters and the federal waters. And, and um, um, a good example is the Alaska Bering Sea Crab Plan. It's a framework plan. It distributes the authority and the management responsibilities for the state of Alaska, ADPG, and mill fisheries. A, a, a bad example is cod. There's a, an emerging cod fishery in Alaska that's state water. It used to be a federal fishery, but the state of Alaska doesn't do anything other than just allocate fish to its fishermen. The federal government does all the stock assessment work, they do all the biology, they do all the accounting, and even the observer program. There's, there's no observer program in the state water fishery. Um, I think there, there's not a lot of language in the Mason Act that directs how and there's a preemption clause and we just like come on do the preemption clause you know they don't touch it so uh, i think maybe you could think about how those relationships or the responsibility of managing the fish uh can, can maybe do, give some direction to the coastal states and the federal government so um that's that's all i have i um, i'm honored to be here i mean there's there's i'm a, I'm a peon compared to some of these people here <laughs> so I'm, I'm honored to be here all right. Uh, first, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome to the North Pacific, where we believe that we have been setting the standard for U.S. and global fisheries for uh, almost four decades. Uh, I'm Stephanie Matson. I'm the Executive Director of the at -Sea Processors Association, uh, based in Juneau. As Brent mentioned, I am, we, a lot of us up here are former uh, council chairs our council members, and I serve on the ecosystem <coughs> committee with uh, Mr. Quake and Dr. Fluhart at the present moment. Um, it's no coincidence that the Magnuson-Stevens Act was authored by two great uh, senators from this region. It is fitting that we are meeting here today in the home state of Warren Mag Magnuson and during the birth week of Ted Stevens, talking about what I believe is the most, one of the most successful natural resource conservation statutes ever written. And since we have a representative case, one cannot forget a Senator Stevens' brother, Senator Enemy, when you talk about the leaders of this region. And for sure. Warren Magnuson and Ted Stevens knew back in 1976 what all of us in the region understand deeply today, that harvesting our abundant fish stocks based on the best available science and long-term sustainability is a sacred trust. A responsibility we owe to our nation and all of its citizens, which, we, which has been a driving force for me as a 45 year resident of coastal Alaska. Fortunately, the legacy of Warren Magnuson and Ted Stevens still burns bright. Through successive MSA reauthorizations, the Alaska model has become a blueprint for national success. By extending the reach of science-based annual catch limits, and meaningful accountability measures to all U.S. fisheries, we can feel great pride as a nation for having rebuilt 46 previously overfished stocks and forcing rates of overfishing to historic lows. On the Senate Commerce Committee, Senators Sullivan and Cantwell keep the tradition of bipartisan results-oriented cooperation on fisheries policy still alive, as well as do Senator Murkowski and Senator Murray, Congressman Young, and the Washington State Delegation. My member companies that operate in the Bering Sea Pollock Fishery are especially proud of their leadership on sustainability. The wild Alaska pollock fishery in the Bering Sea is the largest seafood fishery in the world and accounts for almost one third of all U.S. land use. While other fisheries sometimes get more of the headlines, my member companies work day in, day out to supply product for fish sandwiches, sushi, fish sticks, as well as innovative new products like protein noodles and fish food. <laughs> North Pacific and West Coast fisheries directly employ 70,000 people, and seafood export from Seattle and Anchorage Customs Districts are worth $3.9 billion. Two federal observers, which is paid by the industry, are aboard our vessels reporting everything we catch. 
Through a cooperative structure, we share real-time data to minimize salmon and other bycatch. More than 99% of what we catch is target species, and we utilize every part of the fish for fillets, serene, fish meal, and fish oil. Our carbon footprint for a pound of protein is among the lowest we have. In short, my members run serious and sustainability minded businesses. Mr. Chairman, in that context, our most important ask of any MSA reauthorization process is first, do no harm. Even well intentioned legislation reforms, legislative reforms, have the potential to disrupt our industry and undermine our progress. An example of that danger is the Forest Fish Conservation Act that you have co sponsored this Congress. We can all agree that forage fish are a vital part of the marine ecosystems, yet the North Pacific Fishery Management Council has already carefully crafted forage fish protections under Amendment 36. And the proposed legislation would compel us back to the drawing board and would, in our opinion, invite legislation. Any MSA reauthorization process must be sufficiently thorough, deliberative, and modest to avoid such pitfalls. Mr. Chairman, you have expressed a particular interest in fisheries management in the context of climate change. And there can be no doubt that our members are in many respects on the front lines of accelerating changes in the marine ecosystem. As you consider what climate change uh, related language may look like in any MSA reauthorization, I encourage you to dig deep to understand what our region is already doing under the existing law. The climate change module in our Barren Sea Ecosystem Plan and the world-class science being undertaken at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center are laying the foundation for climate resilient fisheries. Thank you again for the opportunity to share perspectives on behalf of the ATSI processes and I look forward to this. Thanks, sir. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, um, Congressman, for putting on this listening session and sending an invitation to our Congressman from Hawaii, which I'm looking forward to going over there in May for my niece's wedding from Hilo. So, um, and of course, our, our two great representatives from our state. So, um, appreciate you uh, put, putting this together. Um, I'm, my name is Justin Parker, and I'm the Executive Director of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. I'm also a member of the Macaw Tribe. Um, fished from the time I was nine years old till I started working for my tribe in 93. Um, so I was 23 going on 24, I guess. Uh, so I grew up in the ocean fishing, um, Straits of Juan fishing, all sorts of various different aspects of fishing that went into that. Um, I always contend to this day that was the, the overnight trips out there um, off Skagway or Ozet Islands or whatever was probably the best sleep I ever ever got when you're rocking and rolling out there in the ocean. So anyway, there's a little bit of background about me and I'm just gonna kind of cover a little bit of background because a lot of times, you know, I'm not gonna pretend I know the people in the audience or even how familiar you are with the tribes. Um, I know you got obviously crew Kirok and, and um, Koopa Valley down there in the, the Klamath Basin. So, um, but anyway, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission were comprised of the 20 Western Washington Treaty tribes in the state of Washington. Um, we, the commission was formed shortly after the uh, U.S. v. Washington court decision, um, which uh, I guess with the, with the treaties themselves, let me back up to the treaties themselves. So the treaties, what we did is we secured the right to continue to hunt, fish, and gather in our usual and custom areas. And the, the U.S. v. Washington court decision, which otherwise known as the Bolt decision, uh, solidified that. Um, these rights are secured in the treaties of the United States. and. As uh, uh, Representative Jaffal mentioned, you know, the federal trust responsibility that goes with that. And that's something that we're always um, harping on, probably more so than uh, the federal government would like to hear, but we're always making sure that we're, we're stating that. Um, the federal courts that at various levels all the way up to the Supreme Court have upheld this and, and other sub-proceedings with that court decision. Um, but in this case, the, for the tribes, it was reserved the right to 50% of the fish. Um, returning to Washington waters. Um, the USB Washington decision also um, established the tribes as co-managers of the resource. And so what that means is that we have a marriage with the state of Washington through the Department of Fish and 
wildlife and more recently with this, this governor is a little bit more engaged um, when it comes to fisheries management. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's a marriage, I would say it's a marriage we have and we just gotta deal with it, good times, bad times, etc. So um, as far as the, in regards to the, the tribes in our ocean fishery, our coastal tribes down south in Quinault, you move up, up north to Ho, Cleve, and my tribe up in Macaw, uh, participate in the ocean fisheries and maritime zones, uh, these tribes, we have adjudicated uh, UNA areas, usual and custom fishing areas that extend um, far into the federal waters, the EEZ, and I'm supposed to mention the EEZ, so I want to elaborate on, on that. Um, but the ocean fishery also impacts salmon that returns to Puget Sound, and so um, as it does to Canada as well as it does to Alaska, etc. Um, but therefore, the impacts of all the member tribes, fisheries, and our treaty rights are impacted by that as well. Um, our tribes participate in crab, halibut, other ground fish, um, fisheries in the ocean. Uh, as such, the tribes play a critical role with the federal and state governments in managing our shared maritime resources from salmon to habitat. Um, we regularly sit on and participate in co-management forums like Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Pacific Salmon Treaty, International Pacific Halibut Commission. Um, one of the things that, that, that you've been hearing so much is collaboration. For us, collaboration is key. Um, I look at my partner over here, Butch, you know, who's, who's very much engaged with our Billy Frank Coalition. Billy Frank Jr., a longtime chairman who passed away five years ago. Um, pretty much an iconic figure. And I don't even want to say our state, I'll, I'll just say internationally. So. I'll just leave it at that, take it for what it's worth. Um, but he has a way of pulling people together, as he always does, even in, his, in the afterlife here. So um, as far as the PFMC, MSA um, connection, um, tribes, we generally believe that the council process works well here. And it's, it's and, and I've heard a couple different people say this, and it's that the MSA is not in need of a comprehensive overhaul. Uh, you know, we have to change the oil sometimes, air up the tires, maybe change out the brakes, but I don't think we're, we need any kind of um, tranny, uh, uh, you know, swap yeah, out. Yeah. yeah, I think we're operating pretty good there. But we would, however, like to identify several key concerns that should be addressed um, from a tribal perspective. And, and this really falls in the line of sovereignty, um, as well as our tribal council seat when it comes to the sovereignty aspect of it. Um, so the MSA it needs to recognize our tribes as sovereign governments, as, as I've already kind of provided a little bit of background on that. We're pledge to adjudicate off reservation management authorities and not lump into uh, with stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders definitely have a role, and there's no question about it. But when it comes to us being as sovereigns, that's you know talking local, federal, state, tribal, you know, government. So I uh, just want to make sure that we're we're, we're clear on that. Uh, we, we as tribes have managed in the resource since time immemorial, so this is nothing new to us. We're just doing it in a different way. Like I said, I grew up as a fisherman, so for me, t-shirts and a jean was my attire. Now, you know, it's a little bit different, different, different place, different role for me. Um, so, you know, I guess dressing part of me more or less, but I always say representing. Um, but when the MSA references states, it should also include tribes. It's um, is acknowledged and treated on par with other uh, sovereigns. A good illustration of how the MSA fails to acknowledge the tribal sovereignty is the MSA's conditions on the tribal council seat uh, relative to the PFMC. And the MSA currently requires a minimum number of nominations and places a three-year term limit, I mean, excuse me, a three-term limit on a tribal seat. And that's similar to that at large of the industry seats. Uh, tribes and sovereigns have the right to self-govern and therefore choose who they believe should represent them and for how long. They should not have to change their representation or seek additional nominations. Typically you have to submit three, even though the other two know they're not gonna get selected. So uh, my chairwoman always says, you mean I'm gonna gotta submit and I'm gonna lose again? Um, but, but we already have it pre-selected and so we make, make sure that's clear, but we have to jump through these hoops. And um, really, it's merely because of Noah's interpretation of the statute. And so th this is an easy fix, I believe. Uh, we've asked for language changes in the act, uh, reflecting the tribes to see the staff the same stature and similar requirements those held by our state counterparts. Um, so again, relatively easy fix. Uh, relative to NEPA, uh, we support the efforts to streamline the current plan development and amendment process by 
ensuring that plan approvals and regulations are determined as NEPA compliant. Um, you know, I heard the term overfished uh, uh, in a couple of the presentations or opening remarks, and, and I just want to be clear on this, that um, this is something that we really struggle with when, when we use the term overfished, and, and that's how that reads in the act as well. But, but we support the replacement of that term. Uh, overfish would want to better depict stock condition or abundance level. Fishing is not always the sole cause of lower depleted stock abundance. Habitat loss and fragmentation and changes in ocean conditions also need to be a part of that conversation or more importantly, more part of that assessment. The secretary should distinguish between fisheries that are depleting, uh, depleted by fishing and those that are depleted for other reasons in their annual report and draw that distinction. Um, Relative to the potential conflict law between MSA and Marine Sanctuaries Act or the Antiquities Act, uh, tribes support clarification that the MSA should be the controlling law in any case of conflict with either National Marine Sanctuaries or Antiquities Act. Tribes do not want these or other stat these other statute statutes to, to supplant this collaborative work that accomplished to protect and manage the fisheries. Uh, National Marine Sanctuaries are not set up to, with staff with expertise to manage that. Um, they can only close areas for protection that is not compatible with our place case treaty fishing rights. In terms of fishery disaster, and I know Karuk, I believe it was, in one of their in the listening session, they had brought this up as well, and that's another critically important program that supports, you know, not only from our standpoint, but our, our state as well. Um, during these difficult times, it allows tribes to maintain their fishing fleets. That is both an economic and cultural necessity um, in the face of these disasters. Fishing is a way of life for our tribes. It's who we are and what we're about, and we need to need assistance to weather the difficult and unforeseen events that prevent tribes from assisting in meaningful harvest. Um, so this program serves as an important step, stop gap measure to allow tribes to maintain here and vessel until things get better. Um, uh, once funds are appropriated, though, we need to ensure that resources get to the tribal communities in a timely fashion. The secretary should act on disaster declarations within 90 days of receiving a request. Also, there should be time limits to ensure that the resources are distributed to communities after a declaration is made. So we've been advocating this for this for a few years of the administration to include it in their budget. The last time we had it was in the you know, last year, the Obama administration, I believe. But it's not a matter of when will, uh, will there be a disaster, it's a matter of how significant. We're already looking at the 2019 Fraser River Sockeye. Um, our, our guys are starting to put together their, their information and data um, for that. So, and speaking of data, I appreciate all the numbers and data. At, I'm a numbers guy, and so I, I actually don't have any numbers in here, believe it or not, I don't think I do. So I appreciate you taking a little bit of a dive. So I'm obviously coming at this from a little bit different perspective, a little bit of background on tribes. Um, we also think it's important for NOAA to consider the impacts on tribal subsistence fisheries which are reserved by treaty and protected by the U.S. Constitution. Finally, it's important that Congress provides ongoing funding for fishery disaster assistance. Um, they're unfortunately occurring more frequently with climate change and we shouldn't delay support in our fishing communities to wait for congressional deliberation on this program each year. Um, we do appreciate for the markup that, that Congress has continued to put in there. Um, and we, I know we have some in the queue that, that I go all the way back to 1992, uh, but we had that, I know we had that cut off um, from the declaration of January 2017 when Obama last day in office for the Commerce Secretary at the time. Um, so just a few other issues. I'm gonna make a shameless plug for Recovering America's Wildlife Act, because it's right, right, right in your wheelhouse. Um, so we did a fly-in last week, spoke to the House uh, Native American Caucus. So a little bit of misnomer, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, Fisheries is not what we're just all about. So we've got a habitat, environmental, we have wildlife, um, et cetera. So it's, it's uh, uh, back from when we were forming, so after the bold decision. So raw is, is something important and that's a significant amount of resources that would go to our tribes nationwide uh, to be players at the table. Uh, a lot of support from um, our state, even the uh, Kelly Seussun and I did a, a joint letter um, from our Department of Fish and Wildlife on that. So um, very important uh, bill that we're working on. But again, this is all partnerships and collaboration is all about. You know, you mentioned when we started, you bring bringing something in from Hawaii. I know we have some, uh, um, and I think here's from Senator Mikowski's office, and of course we've got 
got our very own Nikki, uh, who's over in the Senate Commerce Committee. So reaching across the aisle, but even going to the other chamber, having them be here to participate. Here's some of the concerns. Um, I know it's, this isn't new uh, to them, but uh, hopefully it's some takeaway from you as well. Um, so some of the other additional issues have had to find out. If many of the issues that were impacting our fisheries outside the control of the PFMC um, process, and they're not related to fishing practices. The, uh, our reports analysis demonstrate we're losing fresh water habitat productivity faster than they can be restored. It's uh, poor land use management is impacting the habitat from agriculture to urban development, etc. Climate change is exacerbating existing habitat problems such as streams that are too warm and don't have enough water. And it's also having an impact on our ocean conditions and they're all going to get worse. And so I know we've been on a special select committee on climate change. Um, you know, hopefully it speaks to you on um, both, both uh, things here. We, we, we need better tools to address these problems. We need improved regulations to protect the habitats uh, that, are, that we currently have and, and additional funding for habitat restoration efforts. And we need to aggressively address climate change uh, as part of this mix. So. Again, thank you for your time and thank you for taking me your um, trip up there. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Hoffman, thank you for chairing this uh, meeting and I guess folks at other meetings, but uh, thanks to Representative Jai Hall to for her hosting of this meeting here. And to Representative uh, Bill Van Ankes for attending, and thank you, Nicole, for showing up. You're all, you're all five star, a uh, rock star to me. So, um, my name is Joel Kawahara. I am a salmon troller from Washington State. I fished in California, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. Salmon trolled and also participated in Albuquerque fishery. I've got a wooden troller that's sitting up in the boatyard in Port Townsend. So I have this much to say, which is four important, four points I think are important regarding the, the authorization. Uh, there's things in MSA that are really working well now from a stakeholder's perspective, and that's keeping stakeholder pers uh, participation as a major part of all of the processing. Uh, members of the AP from the North Pacific are sitting in the audience and from the, the PFMC advisory panel. I served on the uh, Habitat Committee of the PFMC for I think 12 years or something like that. And um, as far as the stakeholders being able to give input to the uh, councils as well as the stakeholders drawing in other people and participating in the issues uh, that are important to the council. I think that's, uh, that's as important as the deliberative process of the council because fisheries are a part of a wider culture and you need the participation of the wider culture, uh, the concern of the wider culture with your fisheries if you want to get anything done. Uh, secondly, another thing that's working well is uh, science driven decision making SSC and agency science are the foundations of policy and decision making. And it's got to stay that way. Uh, to, out of uh, picking policy solutions out of the air, it will not work for fisheries and we won't stand for it. So keep those. Uh, you've heard a lot about habitat. Strengthening, strengthening those ability to protect essential fish habitat from non-fishing impacts, particularly in freshwater, are very important. Sitting on the PFMC Habitat Committee, I uh, was involved in numerous letters on climate down removal, uh, Sacramento Falls, excuse me, winter chinook water out of, out of Shasta, uh, Columbia Basin salmon, Quileute, uh, coho restoration. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. All we could do is send a letter, a nice letter. Uh, so, a PFMC Habitat Committee letter and five bucks gets a cup of coffee in Seattle. Uh, we could do better. <laughs> a small one. <laughs> um, longer term, we need policies, and I'm not actually sure if this should be or it will be an MSA, but being able to resolve competing mandates of 
such as currently the Southern Resident Killer Whale and Salmon that the DFMC is deliberating on. Um, there, um, there's really no guidance from any policy in, in Congress or, or laws in the U.S. that tell us which one of those, um, how to resolve that um, conflict. Except that I don't push them in the in-between and the likelihood is that it's going to check, slam down on fishermen. That's kind of violating the third mandate, keeping it up economically viable fisheries. So that's a little bit long term, and I, I still want to put it on the, uh, on the shopping list. And, you know, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate your brevity and your insights. Uh, Butch, you're next, but before you begin, I want you to know that something like 35 years ago, I caught my first salmon in Iwaka, Washington, on a charter boat. Uh, and I remember this because I had a t-shirt for many years that said, Real Men Charters, Iwaka, Washington. Is there still a Real Men Charters? There's not a Real Men Charters, but it's right next to my, my office. Right next to Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Congressman Hoffman, uh, Congressman Del, Del Benny, Congressman Del Pye, Congressman Case, and a special thanks to Nikki Duchel from Senator Cantwell's office for the opportunity to say a few words about Magnus and Stevens Act. My name is Butch Smith. I live on the ocean near Walker, Washington. I am third generation. Uh, my son is four, and apparently my five-year-old grandson has a genetic defect called Fisherman, and he looks like he'll be number five. And the legacy of sport fishing charter businesses for fishing charter business. For salmon, crab, sturgeon, and other species near the famous Columbia River. I sit at a port of, I sit as a commissioner on the Port of Milwaukee, the Port of Milwaukee, and I currently serve on the Pacific Fisheries Management Council Salmon Advisory Subpanel and have for the last 17 years, including 14 years as the current chair. I also serve on 12 other groups, including mentioned uh, the Billy Frank Salmon Coalition, which I'm very proud of and the Salmon for Our Futures uh, Coalition, both a tribal, non-tribal group working together on salmon solutions. And I also spent, uh, and also on the, on the current, still going, the Governor's Orca Oil Task Force. My community and other communities on the coastal communities are what Washington Senator Warren Magnuson had in mind when he wrote this law in 1976, to preserve fish and fisheries for America. I do appreciate the offer for a few comments on working together um, to make things better. I feel honored to be here with these knowledgeable people, almost all I've been fortunate enough to work with over the years. I am the only sport fishing person on this panel, but we have all much in common. Um, I could talk uh, much more over the five minutes, starting with, we should have been here yesterday, but I'll extend the comments to this. Supporting working waterfronts and coastal communities. Um, Salmon habitat and hatches. I can speak a little on the disaster, disaster aid, which I believe uh, Senator Cantwell has got a bill out of committee and I hope the House will do the same. We had a disaster in 2016. I started working on that March 11th, 2016. We just received our checks in the mail yesterday. <laughs> well, 2008, we received them in seven months. In that time, um, you know, old timers like me, I guess now, we just uh, uh, couldn't survive, but we lost a lot of our younger fishing members, both in the commercial troll industry, sport industry, and I imagine some tribal uh, fishermen too had some rough times. Um, we, we must do better on that. Salmon habitat and hatcheries. The NSA uh, uh, contains a special provision to protect salmon habitat on the West Coast. The loss of salmon habitat due to dams, land development, and pollution. About one-third of the Club River Basin has lost access from salmon, and a lot of which has not been made up in salmon mitigation. Worse, the thing that has been substan substantial cuts in hatchery production in the last 20 plus years, 116 million in the state of Washington, both coho and Chinook salmon, 80 million alone on the Columbia River, which has had a very ne uh, negative effect on salmon fisheries in Washington and the West Coast. I believe we can increase salmon hatchery production in areas where it won't hurt wild fish. The MSA can do a, a very good job in managing offshore salmon fisheries 
I hope we can have better fisheries in the future as a result of restoring hatchery production that mitigate for all the lost salmon habitat. But we also can't forget the habitat that we can fix, fix for our natural spawning salmon. Um, before I close, um, Justin mentioned the word overfishing. I believe overfishing um, lets a lot of people off the hook. Because a lot of people like water users, dam users, polluters, developer, gets off the hook where they can say, it's overfishing, it's not us. When overfishing a lot of times, has, or fishing has not one thing to do with what happened. So I am, have been, <laughs> one of my life challenges for the last 20 years, is to get that word changed to defend and put and put, it, put the blame where it belongs. I will step up if it was my fault. My community, my fellow fishermen will always step up. Okay, it's our fault. But, but we have been blamed for the fault of a lot of others that we have no control of. Um, thank you again, uh, Congressional Representatives and Nikki. Uh, Nikki. Um, I hope all those concerns about the future of MSA will continue to support coastal communities and work on our things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, Congressman Huffman, for providing this opportunity. My name is Lori Steele. I'm the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. We're based out of um, Portland, Oregon, but um, our member companies process uh, fish throughout California, Oregon, Washington, and even into Alaska. Um, I'm primarily focused on the Pacific region, the West Coast region. Um, my companies process the majority of whiting and non-whiting ground fish landed on the West Coast, along with salmon, tuna, dungeness crab, beef shrimp, and just about every other commercial fisheries or commercial species landed on the West Coast. Um, prior to moving to the West Coast four years ago to take on this job, I spent 18 years in my last life as a fishery analyst for the New England Fishery Management Council. Um, so I actually worked on the staff of the council through both of the last reauthorizations um, and have perspective from inside the trenches as well as uh, both of the coasts. Um, here on the West Coast, the conservation successes that we've experienced under MSA are clearly significant and far-reaching. Almost all the groundfish stocks that were overfished at some point in the last 15 years have been declared rebuilt. We have 100% monitoring and full accountability in our fisheries. Bycatch has been significantly reduced. Our fisheries are rebuilt. They're certified sustainable fisheries. However, um, as you are well aware, and as we've all discussed um, a lot over the last few years, we have a lot of economic challenges, particularly in our West Coast ground fish fishery. Um, our non whiting ground fish fishery um, has been on the brink of economic failure for years, and we are struggling to get our now very abundant stocks out of the water and into the marketplace. Since the ground fish fisheries was rationalized in 2011, only about 20 to 30 percent of non-weighting ground fish ACLs are harvested in a given year. The feast or famine delivery of West Coast ground fish and periods of facility shutdowns for processors has left us with an inability to prosecute ground fish business plans. Key employees have left the workforce and moved away from coastal communities to seek more consistent em employment. The economic multiplier, if you will, is not working in our favor as it should be and as it was predicted to be under the law. We need to focus on enhancing the economic success to match the conservation success that we've had under the MSA. I believe we have an opportunity to build on these successes and the lessons that we've learned from the last two reauthorizations. One thing that is clear is that our regional fishery manager, managers benefit from having more tools in the toolbox and a more flexible, adaptable framework for implementing them. We believe strongly in the regional council process set forth in the MSA, and we've seen that the councils are the best suited to tackle regional challenges and develop solutions in collaboration with our affected stakeholders. Based on our demonstrated ability to succeed and learn from past lessons, providing more flexibility should be the fundamental element of any changes to the MSA. 
the addition of provisions that would increase flexibility with respect to stock, stock rebuilding would improve the ability of councils to achieve their objectives. Flexibility is absolutely necessary for councils to address the unique and often changing circumstances that arise between fish stocks, fishing sectors, fishing communities, and our ecosystems. Flexibility is what we need to address changing ocean conditions and ecosystem variability. We support increasing flexibility for rebuilding fish stocks and providing councils with more avenues to address the needs of fishing communities. This can be accomplished in the MSA reauthorization by eliminating the 10-year time requirement for rebuilding fisheries and replacing it with a biologically-based foundation relying on our fishery management process to determine the optimal path to stock rebuilding. We support changing language in Section 304 of the Act from possible to practicable in terms of rebuilding. This change is not intended to allow fishery manage managers unfettered permission to set harvest levels wherever they choose, but rather to allow them to better protect fishing communities without undermining conservation objectives. We support defining overfishing and, determ and thank you Butch, changing the term overfish to depleted throughout the act. This is extremely important. The term overfish unfairly implicates the industry for stock conditions beyond our control. The term overfish is perceived negatively and can, oh, I just read that, and the, the change that we propose is consistent with a more holistic ecosystem-based approach to managing fishery resources. It also may open the door to problem solving outside of uh, the council process and may allow other resources to come in and help. With these changes, conservation and management measures will still continue to be based on the best available science, consistent with National Standard 2. ACLs will continue to be set with precautionary buffers to account for science and management uncertainty, and accountabilities will continue to ensure that ACLs are not exceeded. None of the changes that we propose affect any of the conservation requirements in this act. Over the past couple of years, as we've discussed reauthorization, um, uh, things have changed, things have evolved, and one of my most significant concerns as we move forward, and this relates to several key issues like climate change and ecosystem-based management and forest fish management, um, is the need to, uh, to sp explicitly avoid adding requirements and mandates to the Act without adequate funding to support implementing them. Climate change in particular is something that we are just beginning to understand and the need for science is very clear. We need more data and a better knowledge base before we're ready to incorporate specific mandates to address these issues into our federal fisheries law. <clears throat> our current management system is completely maxed out. Um, we cannot accomplish the current tasks that we have at hand. Um, just this year, our Science Center could not fully fund all of the vessels that we need for our trawl survey to address our ground fish stocks. We are struggling to get by with our current resources. The last thing our system needs now is additional unfunded mandates, additional requirements for more studies, more reviews, and more audits. I cannot support tangling up the MSA with mandates that cannot be funded. Um, I would like to just, um, regarding forage, which is a, a clearly an important issue to everybody, I did want to just point out the comments submitted recently by the Pacific Fishery Management Council to Representative um, Bishop regarding the Forage Fish Conservation Act, as well as a letter to Senator Cantwell on this issue. Um, here in the West Coast, uh, the Pacific Council, and as we've also heard, the North Pacific Council, has taken action to proactively address the importance of forage fish in the ecosystem. The council already has a reasonable approach to managing forage fish within a complex ecosystem. These tools are available to all councils and are already being utilized by the councils. I'm very, very concerned about adding legislation that would require detailed data and quantitative estimates of factors such as dietary needs and trophic interactions, given the lack of data and the significant variation of species and forage needs across the ecosystem. Adding these mandates to the Magnuson Act without the adequate funding and adequate resources to implement them will open the door for legal challenge, which we have all experienced across the nation 
over the last two reauthorizations, despite all of the successes that we've had. We need to minimize the potential for additional legal challenge as we reauthorize the MSA, as this also inevitably ties up more of our limited resources and completely distracts from the real work that needs to occur in order to manage our fisheries over the long term. There are groups out there waiting for this reauthorization so that the door can be opened for them to sue. Let's not contribute to the legal challenge vortex by adding requirements to the law that are either not feasible with current information or with current funding. We should instead be focused 100% on how we can increase flexibility for our managers to more effectively do their jobs. Let's build on the success that we've demonstrated and provide and restore balance to both the conservation and economic benefits of the Madison Act. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members of Congress, who are taking the lead on Magnuson Stevens Act reauthorization and coming to listen and, and talk with us about, about these important issues. Um, as a professor at the University of Washington dealing with fisheries, we feel like we're contributing by training the next generations of, of fishery managers, people who work for NGOs, people who work in private industry, and I'm happy to see people, uh, former students, I'd, I'd like to ask them to stand up, but I don't want to embarrass, embarrass everybody uh, by what they're doing. But they're doing really great work. They should probably be here instead of me. But um, I think that's, that's uh, a role that I, I speak to. Um, the, I will make three or four points that I, I think uh, can be made fairly succinctly. First, as a science-based program, Many of the science issues that, no, that are dealt with in the Magnus Stevens Act are not dealt with uh, in other arenas, or where those, in those other arenas we are facing scientific challenge. And I, I, I offer the Pebble Mine as an example of one of those areas where we want the processes to function the proper way and where science helps us make the right kinds of decisions. Uh, so that, that's only one, one illustration of, of, of that particular uh, issue. Uh, Stephanie Mass and I serve on the Ecosystem Committee for the North Pacific Council. Uh, one of the things that fits very, very well with what Lori was talking about is we feel that the science, you know, where, where best available science is ecosystem science. And so there's not a need to mandate more of it just to support that which is on, that is going on right now. I think let, letting the science speak for itself is, is really an important thing. I, I know that there have been efforts to include more language than, than basically the permissive language that's in the Magnus and Stevens Act, but um, I, don't, I don't see that as particularly helpful unless it's fully funded with a line, line item in, in the budget. Uh, probably more important right now and, and, and of, of critical interest for Magnus and Stevens is, as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the climate change and the changes that are occurring in, in, this, in this region are having tremendous impacts both on the, um, the, the, the uncertainty that we face as, as fishery managers, but in particular on, on communities. Uh, I know that some people don't feel we need more studies, but I really feel like at this time, given our state of knowledge, that Congress in reauthorization could do a, a, a big service by requiring the National Academy of Sciences or National Fishery Service or some other defined body to really address the issues that are, are being uh, faced as, as by climate change in fisheries management and particularly the repercussions on communities, because these vary considerably over, over space and time. That leads to the work that, that you all are doing right now on, on Senator Wicker's bill, the, the disaster relief. People spoke to that. Uh, there's a timing issue on that, but even, even with these issues that we've had in trying to get disaster relief for, for fisheries, we can expect that the uh, 
Climate change is a very slow moving and unpredictable uh, new threat to, to, to fisheries. And I, I really think that there should be a, um, a significant effort being put into uh, understanding the, how we can respond uh, to, to those and what, what is the responsibility of the fishery management agencies and to uh, deal with the issues that come up with communities. Um, there, we, we have difficult times implementing uh, National Standard 8 with respect to communities, and it, it's not going to be any easier uh, if, if we don't have, have uh, some assistance there. Um, the, the, uh, Joe, or Justin spoke to the, to the issue of, of Congress needing to help us understand what to do when there's a conflict of laws, uh, even under MSA, where we're dealing with endangered species and how, how we should work with those. Also with Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, these are both being very successful acts, but they're also producing fairly inflexible uh, situations uh, for, for, for management. And uh, I think that that's, that's a, an important, important issue. I'll end by saying that the, I did a study recently of, of the voting records on the past reauthorizations. And if you realize it, the voting records on Angus and Stevens are virtually unanimous in both houses. And I, I appreciate your efforts to try to bring people together uh, to talk about this so that we can go forward with unanimity in supporting the, the fishing industry around the country and our role in the fishing industry globally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. What a, a terrific panel, and, and uh, I heard such uh, great insights, and I think we have just about every perspective you could imagine represented up here. So thanks for uh, starting off an excellent conversation. We'll now move it into a bit of a dialogue here, and Congressman Cates and I uh, will we'll ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to questions that, that might uh, come from the audience. But uh, I wanted to start out on this issue of climate change because I think almost every one of you brought this up. And I will say that that's consistent with the prior three listening sessions I've had. It seems that everywhere I go, everybody I talk to, people acknowledge uh, that climate change is here. Uh, it's having profound effects, shifting stocks. And uh, the conversation was a little bit different in the Mid-Atlantic uh, because you have several jurisdictions all packed in together and you have shifting stocks that are crossing in and out of these jurisdictional lines. And what Congressman Cates said, I believe that fisheries don't respect uh, you know, boundaries we draw on a map. And, and uh, nowhere do you see that more clearly than mid, the Mid-Atlantic. There seemed in that conversation to be a little more interest in uh, tackling this head on in a Magnuson reauthorization. I'm hearing much more of a pump the brakes message from this panel uh, because it sounds like your regional council has gotten out ahead of this and maybe you don't have as much interjurisdictional pressures uh, that they face in the mid-Atlantic. But I wondered if any of you have thoughts about that when we reauthorize Magnus, and of course we do it for the whole country, uh, including the places that are doing it really well with their existing tools and maybe some other areas where they might need some extra tools. Uh, so I wondered if anybody wanted to speak to that piece of the challenge. Yeah, Linda. Thank you, I'd be happy to start. Um, I, I think while it might be less um, immediate in Alaska and the West Coast because the jurisdictions are bigger, are we? Um, but we are seeing fish such as cod moving from the Gulf to the Bering Sea, pollock from the Gulf to the Bering Sea. So certainly there are some problems brewing as well as salmon starting to move from um, Southeast Alaska up. So I do think there's going to be a need for the science um, to tackle all those challenges with fisheries management as the fish move, but there's also going to be, need to be a stakeholder process of how we resolve these issues as the fish who have been allocated to this community are no longer in front That's of That's the tricky part. I mean, everybody yeah. agrees we need more science, we need more data. Uh, but what happens when these fish move into a, a different jurisdiction, out of a region that has depended on them historically? 
uh, in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, there was some conversation about possibly needing some, some triggers of interjurisdictional consultation that don't exist right now. Uh, although they, they sort of found ways to have those conversations on their own already, they're a little worried going forward it's going to get even uh, more challenging. So any thoughts about you know triggering of jurisdictional consultation? Yeah, I would just, I would agree that there needs to be a way for stakeholders to be part of that process and triggering that kind of conversation. I think setting up that process in advance of the crisis that we see coming um, is really essential. We need to assess our management frameworks and determine where they're actually robust to um, changing climate, changing stock distribution, but equally we need to take a look at our management frameworks. We need to have the resources to look at our management frameworks and find out where they're actually impeding our ability to, um, to adapt to, to shifting stocks. And in the North Pacific, certainly many of the protections that we've built into to many of our management plans now that were our best attempt to balance many of the competing objectives that, that we have in front of us in the Magnuson Act, um, and have worked very well in a stable climate with stable distributions, uh, could turn into um, significant impediments to us adapting. And we can identify that. We, we, we are developing the tools to identify that. But, and, and that's something that, that the full council family needs to be engaged in. It's not something that scientists can go off and do in a row. It's, it's got to be part of the open council process. Everybody needs to understand what tools we have that will work and what tools we have that won't work. And then we need to agree on priorities to address those. And all that's laid on top of our normal work. So uh, again, when I look at it, it's a time and resources issue. Um, not just in terms of the scientists, but in terms of the council members, in terms of stakeholders, in terms of those who care about these issues. But we've, we've certainly done some things right that will help us adapt. We've done some things that, for all the right reasons, that may actually be impediments to adaptation. And we've got to start figuring those out and looking for the triggers to how to change those. Or you want to jump in? Um, yeah, and this is just, I just wanted to mention this really briefly. I skipped over it in my notes in the interest of time. But um, here on the West Coast, um, and maybe it is a, an issue of scale, um, you know, we, and, and jurisdiction, but primarily I think we're experiencing the effects of climate change really in the near shore areas right now. Um, and I just wanted to mention that our states are really doing great things in terms of uh, research and science on changing ocean conditions and hypoxia. Um, particularly Washington, Oregon, and California. I mean, we're really on the forefront here of um, figuring out how to respond to it. So whatever we can do to support the state's efforts, um, I think would so be- Some kind of state-federal collaboration on the, the science? Would, yeah, absolutely, you know? and, and I don't know if it can be done in the Magnuson Act, but whatever, whatever we can do in Washington, D.C. to support and fund the efforts going on at the states, I think would be really helpful. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to. Uh, I've heard several things here that really uh, are consistent with some other listening sessions. One is the term overfishing is something that makes people in the fishing community really bristle. Uh, and I hear you loud and clear on that. There was a conversation in a previous listening session, though, about uh, allowing overfishing to continue as a term in situations where it's actually overfishing. Uh, but to use depletion and maybe other terms that are more descriptive depending on what it, what conditions are actually causing the problem. Any thoughts about whether multiple terms uh, could be employed or is the consensus from this panel that it should just be depletion and, uh, and get rid of overfishing entirely? Uh, I'm a little squishy with that. But, but I might be in the minority here. Um, I, I think that the word depletion and then define what caused the depletion is a better way to do it than have, still have that overfishing in there and be that the spotlight. Your um, point is it's inherently a stigma when you have that term up front. So I, I think I've heard that from a lot of fishing stakeholders. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that too. So, which are not in the minority, so I'm on this one. So. 
um, but I'm used to it. I'm always in the minority, it seems like. So, um, but it, yeah, over overfishing is, is a big uh, concern, um, particularly talking harvest levels that we've been uh, working on, and, and it's been the focus for five decades now. Um, so when we had the, the, or the boat is in the 74, you know, we had um, open fisheries basically, and when we got the boat decision, and we went to 50 50, well, we were made, in a lot of cases, we were better off without that, to be honest. And so 50% of zero is still zero at the end of the day. And so that, that's, that's a, a, a big connotation. You use the word overfishing. And so it, it's not the overfishing, it's not the harvest itself and so that that is really comes with a big stigma but i also want to go back to the, the climate question you the, the connection you're making on the climate and, and for us as i mentioned a couple different times we, we're our tribes are place-based our usual custom fishing areas is is place-based we can only go so far in, in our una i can just pick up the fish start moving east the Puget, into the puget sound i can't just come come in here and start fishing the puget sound i can't go um, north up into Alaska or anything like that. So as the climate impacts, whether it be uh, ocean conditions, whether it be low dissolved oxygen levels, or any of these other pressing issues that, that we're dealing with with our climate, uh, changing climate, um, we're going to be greatly impacted because of that place-based fishery that, that we're um, stuck with. I appreciate it. So just, uh, I know we're, we got a bunch of issues we're trying to cover, and, and this is really helpful, but um, Essential fish habitat. Several of you, and I know I'm in salmon country, so I would expect to hear this. Several of you have talked about the limitations of protecting habitat uh, inland, for example, uh, when we're talking about salmon. I heard this certainly in California, that we have the ability to write a, a stern letter, uh, and that's about it. Um, what more uh, would you want to see for protecting uh, salmon habitat? Would it be a consultation requirement that actually had teeth in the law? Are there other ideas? Uh, certainly the ability to write a letter just doesn't do much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I, I think a consultation requirement would be a, a great first step. Uh, because so much salmon habitat, and just talking about salmon habitat inland now, is also, is also critical habitat. Uh, Making the uh, essential fish habitat consultation a, a, either a part of or an es uh, essential, a mandatory adjunct to the uh, critical habitat designation is uh, a, a possibility. Um, right now, <laughs> essential fish habitat is consulted under the Endangered Species Act, but their recommendations rather than rather than uh, alternatives that need to be, that are mandatory as they are under the Endangered Species Act. I would go that as far as making the consultation mandatory and also the recommendations more, more uh, legally binding, I guess is what I, I'm thinking. What you want to add to that? Well, I'll just give an example from your area. In 2008, the California fishery shut down and we had a, a, the San Joaquin water lawyer come up and testify at the council. Um, that particular year, and, and, and I am, I am, you know, for communities and farms, I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-dam, you know, we, we just gotta, we just gotta work together, but that particular year, the San Joaquin water district harvested more salmon than the whole California coast. And yet there was nothing the council could do except close fisheries down. And so there's got to be a mechanism where everybody puts some skin in the game. Yeah, and, and when they closed it down, they declared it overfish too. And exactly. They, people weren't even allowed to fish. And, and the only people that overfish were the rice paddies and the yeah. almond farms and things like that. And, and so, so anyway, there's got to be a, a mechanism to to that's the one thing that really lacks in the teeth of the City Fisheries Management Council. Uh, just speaking for where I am. Appreciate that. I, I want to hand this off to Congressman Case for any questions he may have, and then we're going to open up to others. Thank you. Uh, I, I share with uh, Chair Huffman a uh, real appreciation. This was incredibly uh, educational for me. 
You know, when I listened to all of you talk, um, something occurred to me, and that was, um, you know, at the bottom, bottom of my, uh, my stock report, every time I get some kind of a stock report, it says uh, something like, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Um, and we are all sitting here patting ourselves on the back as to Magnus and Stevens for the most part. I think I heard almost each one of you say that it was working fundamentally. One of you said don't change it hardly at all. Uh, others of you suggested tinkerings with it, but nobody suggested any fundamental change. And yet as I listened to you, a number of you made the observations that this isn't the same climate, this isn't the same ocean, this isn't the same world in many ways that we're living with. And um, I just wonder openly with you whether we're living in the past performance world as opposed to thinking about what might be in the next 10 to 50 years and whether this incredible tool that has worked quite well on balance is sufficient. For example, I think it was you, Brent, talked about, um, about or, or, or Linda for sure, about um, radical changes in the course of one season. And then I think, uh, Bill, I think you said something about um, how the um, annual um, assessments were not fast enough, or at least you said they should occur every year, and they weren't occurring every year. And I wonder whether uh, things are changing so fast, or have the potential of changing so fast, that in the, in the regime that we've all gotten used to, um, we won't catch major shifts, and we will see major uh, uh, disasters. And, and so my, my question from a Magnus and Stevens perspective is, is this law nimble enough? Is it flexible enough to allow for very short-term uh, changes in, in uh, management? Now, I, I get the funding, funding part of it. Probably some of you are thinking to yourself right now, well, if we had enough money, we could do stock assessments every three months, and then we wouldn't miss that. So I get that. Um, but I just ask you the question, have you considered whether there are areas in this act that limit your flexibility to move on a much shorter time frame uh, than, than maybe we've all been used to in the last four decades. Anybody? Um, Joel, right? You had it up first. Um, just thinking about salmon on the West Coast and the numbers of times we've had to do um, emergency variances to the salmon FMB in order to do something just do anything. Um, not speaking for everybody else's fishery, but being able to do emergency changes and variances to the, the way the FMP describes the fishery have gotten us through some tight spots. I can't say it's sufficient for everyone. We haven't done that review in our mind. Uh, but it's a lot of on-the-fly stuff with a lot of best available scientific judgment. Uh, that's being used right now. So uh, I'd say there is a mechanism. Okay. Uh, who else had their hands up? I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I guess I am, um, what I hear in your question is are the Magnuson Act changes necessary to uh, react to, uh, more quickly to the changes? And I would say no. What may, we may want to look at is what happens after the council acts and the process that has to go through to the agency, to the uh, the NOAA GC review, to the OMB review. I think, and, and, and my friend to the right here mentioned NEPA. That has often caused more time um, delays in implementing things. So I believe that there aren't any statutory changes that would make things at the council happen quicker, because I think the council does have the tools. We do have technology now with models that can model the gaps in uh, potential survey areas or when you can't have a survey. The VAST model, we, we, are, we are building those at the Science Center. But what I do think you may be referring to is how quickly we can act. And there is a delay and a difficulty with implementing the council's actions. And I would encourage you, that's not a Magnuson other than potentially a NEPA change. But I would look at the agency about making sure they had enough resources so they're able to move the council analysis forward through proposed rule and final rule and the reviews that are necessary to make sure they're compliant with all of the national standards. So I would think it's 
It's up the food chain from the council action. I think the council has the tools, but I do think that there may be streamlined processes to implement it on the water. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I would just wanted to add a little bit to that. I think it's a really great question. Um, I, I hear what Joel is saying about having the emergency action opportunity and the councils have used that, but recently the um, interpretation of the opportunity to use the emergency rule has to really be tied tightly to a conservation emergency. And I think we may also see, and we are seeing, social economic emergencies at this point that are going to be driven by climate change, as you mentioned, and the council may not have the tool to move quickly enough, be nimble enough on the front side, as well as some of, I think, what Stephanie was saying, is it can take years on the back side. But, but that might be a place where you have to look at the emergency action and what is allowed under that um, part of the act. Okay, let me, um, if I could just, uh, I'd like to ask one more question and then uh, turn it back to the chair. Um, Brett, you, made, you, you, you commented on uh, selection of council members and that triggered a thought process in my mind. And, and full disclosure, I come from the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council world. I don't know, I don't know that much about your world, um, but I know a fair bit about uh, my world in the Fisheries Management Council, which has been, in all honesty, a little problematic in some areas. Uh, and one of the areas where there is uh, some sense of, of um, um, uh, concern is that the uh, council itself, through the selection process set up by Vegas and Stevens, ends up being a little too heavy on the industry side and on the, the scientific side, which some perceive as being more industry friendly, so that you don't have those independent advocates, those, those folks that, are, that, are, that, that have perhaps a a far more conservative uh, view of the use of the resource uh, than, than perhaps others. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are. Do you, do you, do you perceive that the council, which is re responsible for the administration of Magnus and Stevens, um, that there is, that there is a, any need for um, statutory changes that would provide for a broader representation of people that are concerned with the oceans? I'll start off on that. I think the language in Magnuson encourages um, breadth, but it also leaves it open to each region to determine what sectors are most important. There are a limited number of seats. Not every, not every perspective is ever going to be represented in the council in any region. But for instance, the North Pacific Council has relatively little engagement in recreational fishing management. And so we typically have one position that that's represents recreational. Unfortunately, typically that council member is really interested in a broad range of issues because if they were just to wake up when it was only recreational, they'd be awake for a few hours each council out of every 10-day council meeting. Uh, whereas other councils that, that have a very high degree of recreational fishery engagement need a much different mix. And, and I don't know that and I think the similar issues are true for almost every other perspective you can think of, including environmental issues. And every council certainly struggles with environmental issues, and every council has a contingent of NGOs, sometimes represented on the council, but always represented in the audience, who are there to work the process. And in many cases, at least in my experience with not just our council, but others as well, they can be as effective from their seats out in the audience as they are actually having a vote on the council in terms of the points they make and in terms of their ability to work the aspects of the Magnuson Act that, that talk about the values that they're espousing. So the, the balancing of the national standards, the basic language describing the breadth of experiences that council members should, should have and should represent, I think are, are extremely useful tools we try to engineer it more in federal legislation, I'm not sure how well that will work out. It's Again, it could end up, the danger is you'll have a one-size-fits-all solution and no regional council that actually comes anywhere near that average that you're trying to address. Representative Kaysen, I would also uh, like to add that um, 
you have on each council, for example, in the North Pacific, we have three state representatives on there. Those state representatives are required to represent all of their constituents. So I think that sometimes, and I know I'm industry, but I think sometimes industry is seen as industry heavy. But you have to remember that you do have an agency person on every council. You have state representatives on every council that really should, are required to balance whatever those uh, perceived imbalances are. Um, and I also think that industry is a broad brush, but I would argue that my membership is concerned about environmental. We uh, are active in uh, finding solutions and minimizing bycatch. And so it's not all the bottom line and dollars. And I think sometimes we get kind of broad brush that that's all we care about and that we're willing to go and get that last fish. And for my membership, and I think most industry folks, that's not the case. Real quickly, I think we have a couple more, then we're going to open it up. We're running a little late. but. Uh, quick additions on whether the council structure needs broadening. Uh, that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very, very quickly, the council decision-making process, at least at the FMC, and only discussing that, uh, depends quite a bit on its stakeholders and its uh, advisory subpanels. The advisory subpanels are, at least in the PFMC, very well balanced. There are conservation seats on the sound advisory subpanel. The Habitat Committee was primarily composed of uh, state agency habitat specialists. Uh, all uh, the uh, non-state people were the fishing people, but we are um, very well informed by the NGOs in uh, the Habitat Committee in all, in all of the aspects that we uh, uh, reported back to the council. I think, at least in the uh, EFMC, it's well balanced from the stakeholder point of view, and those perspectives make it into the recommendations to the council that the council takes. Uh, okay, we we got to keep moving. Butch, do you have a? You know, I just echo. I, I think you know. I write this down. I, I agree with what Bill said. I think. Um, but but I I would tell you that that the PFMC is a science driven organization. They, they, the, the science weighs heavy before a decision is made. As it should be. I can't speak for other councils, so I think we gotta we gotta think about that broad brush. Um, you know, don't make that too broad. If, 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 there, if it's a BB gun, you need don't take a shotgun. You know what I'm saying? So, so I, I think that um, that decisions, you know, ESA and other things, and, and, and everybody's got to put at the table. Yeah, that's the council. All right. Uh, yeah. It's a, first, briefly, I think my my comment was you want your best and brightest on the council. And I, my organization does not support designated seats on the council other than the tribal seat because that's co-management. And we, we work very closely with the tribal representative on the Pacific Council. But as far as trying to find like an ENGO or this year type or this resident from this community and requiring that in the magazine, we don't support that at all. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's time to hear questions or comments from members of the audience. Yeah, please just state your name and try to be as succinct as you can. Thank you. I'm going to talk as fast as I can because uh, happy hour, uh, Bristol Bay, um, happy hour has started already over at Fish Expo. I want to get back over there. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Johnny Fishmonger. Uh, I head up uh, Wild Salmon Nation. We're a West Coast based wild salmon um, protectors um, and we protect well, some onids from the most southern reaches in uh, Ensenada, Mexico, steelhead runs, all the way to uh, um, up around the corner in the Mackenzie River now, where there's stray uh, pink and chum salmon runs. Um, I want to thank uh, the Duwamish people for letting us be on their land today, and uh, Chief Self, and uh, also um, want to um, shout out our support for the Baca um, Nation and uh, your treaty rights and your rights to harvest marine mammals. Um, that needs to be respected and, and uh, we, we want to support you guys in your fight on that. So, um, so hey, uh, we could talk uh, um, real quick about, about uh, we, mostly, we mostly support small boat fishers and, uh, and some serious struggles, boats under 60 feet all up and down the west coast. So uh, not too many tears shed for uh, 
the catchers and factory trawlers and all you guys, you know, I'd like to see more human um, observers on all your boats. I'd like to see more oversight of forage fisheries and all the bycatch that affect all of our fisheries, halibut, king salmon, forage fish, you name it. Um, and uh, also, uh, Senator White here is off act um, that wants to open up the EEZ to uh, open net cage fish farms, stress that uh, fight that like hell. Um, and uh, also, you know, medicine needs to be really, really respectful if there's a reauthorization to small boat fishers and small boat families. My grandmother was Magnuson's secretary in DC during the 60s. The one time I met Senator Stevens in Cordova after we just launched Copper River Salmon on the Copper River Salmon race, he wouldn't shake my hand. So. Uh, no, no love for that guy, but uh, maybe some was standard. But you know, it could have been just a grumpy day for Ted. There was a lot of that. Um, but, and also, um, we're fighting, we, we fought to get these Atlantic Salmon Farms banned out of Puget Sound. And right now we're dealing with Cook, is trying to restock them with black cod, which really affects all the fishers up and down the West Coast. And a, you know, a very viable fishery, a very you know, money, big dollar fishery, a lot of small um, stakeholders. Um, and also, um, they want to stock it with uh, sterile um, steelhead, um, uh, triploid steelhead. But you guys, both your um, states um, um, are involved, and also with some offshore fish farm. Um, Ed, um, uh, Constant Case, uh, um, Kona Kabaji, we're always concerned about where they're getting their feed. You know, that's a huge problem. We're talking about forage fish, worldwide forage fish are being exploited to feed the gaping maw of aquaculture all over the world. The other big problem is a lot of people that we work with, we're talking about Samoa, Humboldt Bay, the big, huge Norwegian, massive fish farm, and they can't talk about how they're gonna deal with their waste, talk about where the feed's gonna come from. So really would like you guys to pay attention to what's happening with offshore fish farms, all fish farms, because it's a real big threat against small family fishers up and down the West Coast, and especially this wild salmon fishers. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Con uh, Chairman, can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, and panelists. Thank you, uh, Kevin Scribner, Forever Wild Seafood. I live now in Walla Walla, Washington, a little uh, uptown, upriver town that uh, actually has salmon get and get to it. I'm a Bristol Bay fisherman. Uh, very interested in the value-added uh, uh, product line. And so um, we fishermen um, are want consumers to know who their fishermen are, but I think fishermen should know who their, who their customers are. And so one of my uh, interests is to also have Magnuson reflect the fact that uh, Magnus Stephen that it's you know, akin to what some folks are trying to do with the farm bill, to have it be the farm and food bill. So to be able to have this be the sustainable fishery and seafood bill, so we actually have the customers part of it. And um, there's, there could be a role for one of the super customers out there, which is the chef world, you know, because they're kind of a bridge to the customer world. And maybe in terms of the existing structure, you know, my friend Joel talked about sub panels, is to be able to, maybe that's a role where, you know, the, the consumers and customers could have a role at the council level. So one thought. The other is working waterfronts. Very keen on all of that uh, effort, and a number of the panels have talked about that. And uh, I'm very excited about your one of your uh, colleagues, uh, Congresswoman Pingree, who is working on that. She's got the, the bill on the infrastructure side for walk working waterfronts. I think there's some work on, uh, on, the, on the Community Fishing Association side of it, you know, that could be coming out. Whether that's a standalone or part of Magnuson, I think those are very, very important. 